In the early 20th century, America had open borders. Between 1850 and 1913, 30 million immigrants entered the United States. Of these, approximately 300,000 were Lithuanians. They were coming from the country of Lithuania, fleeing poor economic conditions, Russian oppression, famine, and in some cases, just seeking a better life. About half of the arrivals were illiterate. Many were not even identified as Lithuanians, as Lithuania was under Russian control until 1918. In many cases, they were listed as Polish. They came here who could not read and write. Can you imagine? Me? And the Lithuanians could not read and write, not because they were not brilliant, but because they didn't want to learn Russian. They didn't want to learn in Russian. The church was all in Polish. So the um, uh, God spoke Polish, and the pagan, which was Lithuanian, God would not understand it. So here was the decision. You learned Lithuanian at your mother's knee in the house, you went to school, which they didn't want, the parents didn't want you to learn that Russian because it was such oppressive slavery. And the church, you learned your Polish, but just for the church. And here we have this thing. And so they ran away from the army. Many of them came here, but they came with Polonized names because when there was a marriage or a birth certificate, it was written in Polish. And so when they brought these names, they were Polish names. and. Many of them changed to American names because I, I really now for the first time understand why the change of names because it wasn't their name. It was Polonized, it was Russianized, and so they changed it to an American name. And, and, uh, and this is the way we have many names this time. Many of the first Lithuanians settled in Pennsylvania and went to work in the mines. They settled in Pennsylvania towns such as Frackville, Mahanoy City, New Philadelphia, and Shenandoah. By the late 1890s, Lithuanians represented 25% of Shenandoah's population. The area became the hub of Lithuanian first wave immigrant activity. To this day, that area's population includes many with Lithuanian ancestry the descendants continue to identify with their Lithuanian roots. Mining was hard, back-breaking work. Lithuanian miners had a strong work ethic and recognized when conditions were unfair. Lithuanian workers played an important role in the growth of the United Mine Workers Union as well as the Amalgamated Garment Workers Union. The first Lithuanians arrived in Rochester in 1890. By 1905, there were over 400 Lithuanians in Rochester mostly single men coming from the mines of Pennsylvania, looking for better jobs. We're here today in Jamestown, Rhode Island with Birita Butrimas. Her ancestors were actually uh, one of the founders of the Rochester Lithuanian community. Um, so Birita, um, do you know anything about your ancestors? I actually did not know any of that until you told me and I dug out that one book and I read and I went, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, I never knew that. So okay, well, I didn't. I'm going to just tell you a little bit about mm -hmm. who they were and I'm mm -hmm. sorry but I do have to read this. Um, Birute's relative, uh, Adomas Butrimas, um, was recognized as one of the original founders of the Rochester Lithuanian community. It is speculated that he arrived in Rochester in 1897, and he married the very first Lithuanian female that arrived in Rochester, who was called Barbara Stolpenaita. 
Um, he became a member of the St. Peter and Paul organization mm -hmm. because early on they mm -hmm. organized themselves in different um, Catholic-oriented organizations. Mm -hmm. He suggested that they spearhead the building of the Lithuanian Catholic Church, which, as you know, was, uh, was the focus of a lot of Lithuanian cultural activity. He and his brother, Vincentas Butrimas, um, are listed as being key figures in soliciting donations from the local Lithuanians towards the creation of what later became St. George's Church and Parish. St. George's Church became the center of a thriving Lithuanian religious, cultural, and social community. The Lithuanian parishioners uh, built the church. We had to demolish the property and build the church there in the corner. That's St. George's built the church right there in the corner. Yeah. Oh, as far back as I can remember, I remember them being very active, uh, the ladies, and making d dinners. Um, we've always, they seem to have always have chicken dinners that the ladies put together. And I still remember them taking all the roasters over. They prepared them in St. George's Kitchen, and they had like a brigade that uh, took it over to kind of Pico's Bakery for, for baking. So I just remember all that. Tell us about your parents. Did they come from Lithuania or were they born here? No, they came, they came from Lithuania. When did they come? Oh, way back in 1926, maybe. No, before that. But we moved over on, we lived on Dayton Street where I was born. Dayton, which is off Hudson Avenue. Because <clears throat> this was all farmland out here. They didn't have this all built yet. Mm. Did they speak Lithuanian at home? Yes. <clears throat> when we came home, we had to speak Lithuanian at the table when we ate or anything like that. And that's where we learned the language a lot better than we did in school. Because in school, we just talked with the kids and stuff. We had Lithuanian classes in school. But, uh, they didn't do too much for us. Well, my mother was a tailor. She worked at Timely Clothes, Ricky, Ricky Freeman. So my dad worked at Bal Shalom. When he he that's where he spent all a lifetime at Bal Shalom, working there. Were they um, graduates of high school or grammar school? Or? No, they came over. I don't. I think they didn't go to any school here in the United States. I recall, they just worked, worked. We used to live on Hudson Avenue over, uh, we owned, a, my dad owned a block on Hudson Avenue near Warsaw, Watkin Terrace, yeah, on Hudson, not too far from the church. And uh, my mother was a tailor, she worked at a tailor shop, my dad at Bashalam. We were just kids, my sister and I. My mother was born in 1910 in Shenandoah, Pennsylvania. Uh, a year later, they came to Rochester. I don't know why. My uh, mother did go to Holy Redeemer School, though. And she pull, was pulled out of school when she was 11 to go back to Lithuania, where my grandfather had a farm. Uh, my grandmother and grandfather were both farmers. And, um, and my dad came over to to Rochester in 1919. And he worked at Rochester Piano Works, East Rochester Piano Works. And then for the rest of his life, he was a, a, worked in the foundry at American Laundry Machine Company. My mother was a stay-at-home mom, so we, my brother and I got into high school. And she went to work for Xerox, and she retired from Xerox. Did they speak with women? Uh, I went to St. George's School not knowing any English. It was only Lithuanian spoken at home. So when I went to St. George's School, the school was downstairs and the church was upstairs in the hall. Right. My um, grandparents, I think first, my grandfather, Jonas Jokšas, came. Um, Ponas uh, Valerius Vitkas sponsored him and I guess stayed with him. Um, until he got established. Um, my grandmother came, um, Ursula Butkaita, 
and they were married here in Rochester. And um, I guess they were the first um, couple to be married in the old, the first church, the old, what we had as the parish hall when I knew it. <laughs> so that was November 8th, 1910. They were, they were married there. And um, they, I think they owned the, pro the, the house, the property behind where the new church is. They owned that house. And when it was time to build the new church, they um, gave, or I don't know if they gave or they sold the property to, you know, um, for St. George's Church. My grandfather fled um, Lithuania so he wouldn't have to go into the Red Army. Um, my grandmother, um, I think, I think the families knew each other. Um, she came, I think her family wanted just a better life for her. I remember my mom, my mom saying that her mom um, you know, would talk about how they, they hid their books underneath the floorboards and um, they, they had to talk Russian in public. Um, so those were a couple of things that she, yeah, she was there. And um, she, my mother remembered a Russian lullaby that she, her, her mother said she knew and, you know, would sing to her sometimes. Of course, she would, you know, in Lithuanian as well, but, you know, they were, you know, um, they were scared to, to talk in Lithuanian and, and to read or, you know, do anything like that. Well, my grandfather, Jonas, was very active in the St. Peter and Paul Society. And my mother said something about he was the treasurer at some point in the building of the new um, church. So I'm not sure if it was the exact time or before or what. Um, that is something I never really um, researched at the parish, you know, in the records. And my grandmother was involved in the the choir. They used to do dinners and all that kind of stuff. I know she used to cook. My grandfather was, was a businessman. He, um, he was a tailor. He became a tailor and he um, built the building that's across from the new church. And on one side he had his tailor shop and my grandmother was a seamstress with him. And on the other side was the, um, his ice cream parlor and they lived upstairs. So my mother always remembers him being in suits and carrying his pocket watch and he had his roll top desk. And, um, you know, she would sit and, um, you know, play with his papers with him because he was always doing, conducting some kind of business, taking care of something, so. Pamela, her daughter, and her sister, Barbara Miller, continue to be active in the Knights of Lithuania, a cultural charity supporting Lithuanian causes in America and Lithuania. Both myself and my daughter, Sophie, are uh, members, and they hold a convention every year, as they always did, and we have mass. We um, have, of course, our business meetings, and we do cultural things. We usually have like a cultural night. And there's some that are GPs as well. And um, they come from all over the United States. And the convention is at a different city every year. Um, and the members are active at various levels. There's some that, that um, you know, are, are associated with, with people in Lithuania and um, work to help them. We have a couple of um, charities that we support. One is Our Lady of Shilava Foundation, and that is to help support, you know, an awareness of Our Lady of Shilava 
Um, we have events at the National Basilica in Washington, D.C. Um, we have the St. Casmer's Guild, which um, helps fund the Lithuanian Seminary in Rome. Um, many people are very generous. Rochester, Lithuanian Algier de Bertman recalls the early days of St. George's Church and School. His memories trace back to the building of St. George's Parish Church. I was only three years old at the time, and I was surprised uh, that I could remember that uh, being built because the cornerstone says 1934. And uh, it started out with a vineyard, and uh, they were clearing the land, and uh, there was a horse-drawn stone boat, which is like a big tire rim with a couple of handlebars on it, and they were rolling these big boulders across the uh, lot there, and I was really fascinated by that. But then the next thing I can remember was the uh, actual uh, church being built and the bricks being put up, and a great many of the uh, workers were parishioners. And my dad, who was a tailor by trade, actually uh, mixed the mortar, and uh, I was fascinated watching him mix the mortar because there were two holes in the hole that he was using, and I could not understand why that was, but I guess it facilitated the actual mixture of the mortar. But however, they uh, stacked these bricks up on the uh, a box and then it had a pole on the end and they tilted it up. I don't remember the formal name for that device, but uh, the other thing that I do remember was that Mr. Benner fell off the scaffolding and hurt his back, but uh, he came back from it and uh, he recovered nicely, I believe. So. I started going to school at the age of uh, five, so that would have been 1935, which meant that the uh, new church was already up and running. So all we did was utilize the uh, second floor for uh, the classrooms, and uh, the uh, northeast corner uh, was our library, and then the uh, Southeast corner was the first, second, and third grade, and then the uh, southwest corner was the fourth, fifth, and sixth grade. So uh, I started, of course, uh, at the first grade at age five, and uh, Sister uh, Mary Elizabeth was our teacher there, and uh, uh, there were probably only about 10 kids in the classroom, and uh, we had two Italian boys, which was kind of interesting because uh, everything was pretty straightforward Lithuanian at that time. My mother tells me that I never really spoke any English until I got to school because everything in the house was a Lithuanian. And uh, then when I started my school days, I think I started answering her back in English and they spoke to us in Lithuanian. We had the first, second, and third in the uh, one classroom, in the southeast corner, which became uh, the museum for the uh, Lithuanian heritage people. And uh, then I progressed from there to the uh, fourth, fifth, and sixth grade, uh, Sister Mary Alverna. And uh, the biggest recollection I have there was that uh, we celebrated the uh, Holy Ghost at the time uh, by stringing uh, uh, strings over each pew or row of uh, desks and hung down uh, cutouts of the, uh, a dove and with a long fiery tongue and uh, hung over our heads, you know, and that, that was our uh, exposure to the uh, Holy Spirit. So, and then the other thing I remember uh, vividly was uh, we had a spelling bee contest and I won that and uh, it was elimination type of thing. But the other thing the, uh, was that uh, Sister Alverna had me write, I will not turn my head in church 350 times. I filled up every blackboard in the classroom uh, from top to bottom uh, with that, uh, I will not turn my head in church. But I think she had an ulterior motive because I had terrible handwriting and I have it to this day. And. Uh, I don't believe uh, that uh, she cured me of that problem. I can show you my report card. The tuition was a dollar a month, okay, and, uh, when I was in the eighth grade. And uh, so that, that's the way things were. My recollection of uh, us learning Lithuanian was uh, devoted about an hour each day when we were in the seventh and eighth grade. 
And uh, it was very formal because they discussed the cases, like in the English language you had three cases, nominative, possessive, and objective. And in Lithuanian language, I think it had like about six cases and it made it very difficult. And we used to drill like uh, o vaikas, o vaikia, o vaikai, you know, that type of thing. And uh, uh, in English, they used to diagram the sentences and all that. But as far as the Lithuanian, uh, there was no mandatory speaking of the Lithuanian, but uh, it was just a devoted about an hour a day. And, uh, the devotion to the Lithuanian language being taught there for all the students, or was it like an option that you would you would choose <clears throat> to go to this class? No, no, it was right as we sat in our classrooms, and when it came time uh, for the during the day for Lithuanian language, you, know, you just stood there and took it and uh, tried to absorb as much as you could. I remember Mutz Yunus's grill that was on the corner of Watkin Terrace and Hudson Avenue. Shirellis had an oil and coal company first, closer to Clifford Avenue. Uh, the business was in front. He lived in back. Kind of Pickus uh, Bakery. Kind of Pickus Bakery. Then I remember Milavich and Gursky Meat Market that we used to go every day to get our meats on Hudson, on Hudson and Bernard Street. There's all the Lithuanian neighborhood on top of Hudson Avenue. As you go down towards Norton Street, it was all Polish and down there, sea stamps. And very active was, was Dearso's. A lot of people stopped by Dearso's bar, uh, which would later became Wisman's when Mr. Dearso retired. He's starting on the uh, left side of uh, Hudson Avenue on the west side, uh, north of the church, we had Brackness Studio. And uh, Clarsing Clifford Avenue, we had uh, Yonina's Meat Market. And a little further down, we had Morkin Funeral Home on the corner of Alphonse Street. And then another block, we had uh, Joe Dirso's uh, Restaurant and Grill. And uh, further down by Berlin Street, we had uh, Henry Milavich's uh, Butcher Shop. And uh, Let's see, on the east side, uh, across the street from the church, we had uh, Shirellis Coal and Coke. And then on the corner of Walk and Terrace, we had uh, Mozzunas Grill and Restaurant. And uh, further down near the firehouse, the uh, Engine 16, there was a barber shop there. Uh, Shukis uh, was a barber. and. Uh, just back, coming back a little bit, there was a Hudson Theater and the uh, Gerviskas family lived just north of uh, the Hudson Theater. And across the street, there was another barber shop there and the Luxus family lived in behind them, but I can't remember the bar barber's names, but there were two of them. And uh, so there were a lot of uh, Lithuanian uh, businesses right along Hudson Avenue there. and. Uh, they seemed to end right around Avenue D because north of Avenue D was like became Polish town. And uh, but there were a lot of Lithuanians living down there. The Belaciuses lived on Warsaw Street, and uh, uh, Bill the Cavages lived on, uh, I believe, Fairbank Street. So. Uh, what about okay, back to kind of Pitka Speaker. I forgot about them. Sure, they were a keystone item there, and. Uh, uh, I believe Mrs. Konopikas was Polish and uh, Mr. Konopikas was Lithuanian. And, uh, but their bakery was used to cook all the foods. And whenever we had banquets in the upper hall, uh, which held about 300 people, uh, the uh, food was cooked in roasters and then there would just be a whole bunch of people come over, grab the roasters and bring them to the upstairs church hall where the food was uh, broken down and uh, distributed to the tables. And uh, that was quite a affair, all these banquets, because uh, all the young people knew the routine. The tables were all underneath the stage, 
And you opened up the doors and pulled the tables out and set the tables up and the chairs were there under in racks and we also set them up. And uh, the younger boys like myself would uh, run the cloakroom down in the classrooms and we used the desks to store our uh, customers' clothes during the winter months. And uh, everybody pitched in and worked hard. And uh, the bazaars, uh, they had them around Thanksgiving, and uh, the big things were the uh, spinning of the wheels for uh, winning wine. And I remember Felix Schlepatis, he was one of the uh, uh, easy spenders because he was a bachelor and he had a good job at Kodak. And uh, he wound up sometimes in frustration, he would buy the whole table and he'd say, spin the wheel because I'm going to win this bottle of wine, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but he wasn't lucky the other way, so he'd buy the whole board. <laughs> but there was uh, Joe Durso, uh, he used to buy uh, chips by the yard uh, from uh, John Kazak, I think it was, the father of the Kazak family. And uh, he'd have him hang around his neck and he treated everybody to beers and so forth. And uh, so we had a few people there like that that. Uh, spent money freely in support of these affairs. John Levitskis ran a dice game at the bazaars, and uh, the prize uh, was a live chicken. Okay, so the uh, custodian at the time uh, was uh, Carayos, uh, king, and uh, he would go out and get the chicken out of the back uh, shed there that was attached to St. George's and bring it in and here the winner would be going around the rest of the evening with a uh, chicken tucked underneath his arm. And uh, what I did, uh, the game consisted of uh, throwing three dice three times and I would quickly add up the dice and uh, write the person's name down and then whoever beat him, I would write that name down. So at the end of the page, the highest score won the chicken, you know. I forgot about business is okay. There was uh, North Derry on North Street, and it was uh, Ignaz Kaidis, and uh, I can't remember the father's name, the Unitas, though. And uh, so there was Ed and Frank and Vic uh, were the boys there, and uh, Vic became a deacon, and uh, Ed, he was uh, high up in the uh, Union and uh, General Motors uh, Rochester Products plant. And Frank, uh, I'm not sure what he uh, uh, did, uh, you know, but uh, he was helpful to me when we had uh, part of the fundraising, okay, uh, for the church. We would uh, have paper drives, like during World War II, and uh, we collected scrap. Well, he used the dairy truck, delivered milk normally, to collect all this stuff. And uh, people would let us know that they had paper to donate and we would go pick it up. And, uh, but we sold the paper for a dollar a hundred pounds, which is big money when you think about that. And uh, we raised a hundred dollars and that was used to buy the knotty pine wood that was uh, used to build the basement uh, hall. Today it's now been painted, and, uh, but it was originally Naughty Pine. And as a teenager, I got the job of sanding it. The older guys put the boards up and I wound up sanding it and then they finished off the uh, Naughty Pine. But anyhow, that was funded all by the money we raised from the paper drive. Uh, and uh, so, about $100. North Dairy uh, delivered the uh, milk right to your door, and we had a little uh, carton uh, uh, there. It was kind of had insulation on it, it had metal covering and a lid, and uh, usually about two quarts at, at a time, and uh, they uh, delivered the uh, milk and picked up the uh, bottles that we had washed. And I remember we, we did have refrigeration in those days. Uh, we had uh, ice boxes and you hung a sign in the window, it was a triangular sign, and uh, according to the amount of ice that you wanted, it was color-coded, 
the way you hung it in the window would tell the ice man how much to chop off of his block of ice and bring with his tongs into your uh, ice box. And in the winter months, what my father did was raise the bathroom window and put in a wooden box into the window and uh, we could close the window and now our milk and our perishables were kept outside on a windowsill uh, in the bathroom. And uh, but, uh, we, in those days we didn't have homogenized milk and the cream always rose to the top and in the winter months the uh, freezing of the milk would push the cream out the top of the bottle along with the cap, you know, and it'd be sticking up about two inches out the top of the bottle, you know, and uh, so that, that's what life was like uh, before we, we got a refrigerator. I'm Jean Lauda. I'm the daughter of Connie and Dot Eismont, and I think uh, older Lithuanians remember my dad's dairy, North Dairy. Hi, and I'm Bev Dobney, formerly Beverly Eismont, and Connie and Dot were also my parents that owned the dairy. My grandfather owned it with Mr. Kyrus, and my thinking is, and it's only thinking, uh, is that my great, I, I would guess that my grandfather bought it from Mr. Kyrus. So when I was a kid, they brought the milk in by horse and, horse and wagon, oh. in cans, in big metal cans, right from the farms. What year was that? I would say, well, when I went to school, even when I went to school, there were horse troughs on Hudson Avenue and on, on North Street. So, I mean, there were still horses around at the time. So that would have been early 50s. And uh, I don't remember when it switched to trucks, to truck, you can talk, speak about that. But uh, it actually it came in big silver cans and uh, my dad and grandfather would uh, put it into the pasteurizing machine, which was this great big huge tank, and then they bottled it. This was the quart bottle with a typical cap. And Bevy Noten mentioned in her thing that you could know what the milk was by what color the cap was. Is this cap? is Guernsey. I, knew <laughs> I know, I know me too. Although it doesn't say on here, it's kind of worn out. But that's how we Yellow knew was it. Homogenized and purple was buttermilk. buttermilk. Skim milk, I think, was blue. If I remember rightly, and chocolate was brown, <laughs> and each cap had its own color. Yeah. I remember that I think when Upstate Milk started getting really big, and I think it was Upstate Milk at the time, I'm not positive, they started bringing the milk in in big, huge, silver uh, liquid haulers. And it would come up to the side of the dairy and it would be pumped into a tank. And it was probably the beginning of the end when that sort of stuff happened because then the big stores, the, the, big, depart the big grocery stores really took a chunk of the milk business away because people would get their groceries and their milk at the same time. And they would also do cheap prices on milk to get people in the store. But I do remember it coming in in great big silver haulers. And I can remember the process started at the far end of the building where there was this huge machine that had all these little metal holders and they would put the bottles into these holders and they would rotate through and they would sterilize the bottles. And once that was done, it would ride along a conveyor belt around this big. And the conveyor belt would go down and then at the end of the line, I just remember this huge metal sheet that came out of the ceiling yep. that had, I want to say water or something coming down it, but Eventually the milk came down, whatever it came down into, and then these bottles went around a round cylinder thing that the milk would be in. And they would go around the cylinder and they would get filled with the milk and then at the very end it would get capped with the cardboard caps. And then it would run down the line again in the same direction it was going and then somebody at the end had to take them off and put them in cases. Our poor dad had no life. Um, he would really get up at 2 o'clock in the morning, every morning, and he would go and get the milk and put it in the trucks. In the summertime, I do remember there was ice, and he would be delivering at two o'clock in the morning, and come back sometimes, I'm gonna guess maybe five or six o'clock, and he would bottle, and then he would go back out again, and he would start delivering to the bars and the schools that were open. I just remember the real thrill being the kid at school, and I can remember milk bottles, the little half pints used to be along the chalkboard wall 
and you could either order milk, either white milk or chocolate milk. You had to order what you wanted at the beginning of the week, and the little bottles would be stacked up, and during break you would have that milk. But I was always so proud.